One of the first thing is the riders. And I know they're mad. Even when I get my teeth cleaned, I hear about how angry my dentist is about the red line. You can't go anywhere without hearing this. But the thing I don't hear is, oh, it should close. Oh, it should go away. Oh, we should do something different. We should get private vendors. No one is saying that. No one has said that. People just want it better because it is ingrained in the fabric of the Commonwealth. The T is Massachusetts. Good afternoon, I'm Bob C. I cover transportation for GBH News. And as you can see, we've titled today's program, Teeing Up the Future of the T. Uh, following a year of collisions, derailments, and safety-related incidents, the Federal Transit Administration completed a four-month-long investigation into safety practices at the T, and in August released a 90-page report. That report revealed many problems plaguing the MBTA, from failing to maintain its aging infrastructure to not effectively responding to safety issues that had been noted in the past. It issued a series of directives detailing what problems were found and requiring the T to come up with plans to address them. The report, in a sense, creates a roadmap for the T's future. Well, what lies ahead and what changes can we expect? Well, today we have with us a panel of four experts to help us answer those questions. We welcome Senator Brendan Crichton, born and raised in Lynn, and state senator since 2018. He's now the Senate chair of the legislature's Joint Transportation Committee. Monica tibbets nutt is the executive director of the 128 Business Council, and Monica has served on MassDOT's board of directors, and she was the vice chair of the Fiscal Management and Control Board that oversaw the MBTA from 2015 to 2021. Brian Kane is executive director of the MBTA Advisory Board, representing the 150 plus communities served by the MBTA. Kane spent eight years at the MBTA in many capacities, including manager of operating budget and was on the senior staff of several MBTA general managers. And Kalik Williams is the senior organizer at Community Labor United. He advocates for more accessible transportation for youth and working class families. Welcome to all of you. Also, Josh Ostroff, Interim Director of the Transportation for Massachusetts Coalition is co-moderating this panel. Josh has actively worked with us to shape this discussion and he will be receiving questions from the audience. Josh, a few words from you before starting the conversation. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm pleased to be with you today and uh, as always to partner with WGBH Forum to uh, cover important topics around transportation. Transportation for Massachusetts is a statewide advocacy coalition. We're working with 100 members and partners across the state for a more just and sustainable transportation network that will better serve everybody that lives here today and for years to come. I want to extend my thanks to our panelists today and to all who are watching today or on a recorded uh, video. Thank you so much to all and looking forward to a great discussion. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, as we mentioned, the FTA report was kind of unprecedented, only the second time that agency has uh, in, conducted an investigation of a transit system. And uh, it was pretty exhaustive in terms of its examination. And what it provides in its final report with a whole series of directives, as I mentioned, is a sense of roadmap uh, and for rebuilding the T and especially the public's confidence in it. I'd like to ask our guests one at a time how you see that roadmap and what changes do you think need to happen at the T to make it a better and safer system? Let's start with you, Senator Crichton. Thank you, Bob, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on here with such a, a great group, uh, really talented uh, experts in the transportation field. I feel a little inadequate here, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, the report obviously highlights uh, you know, some very uh, important steps that he needs to take. It also echoes a lot of what was already reviewed uh, back when Monica was the, the vice chair of the Fiscal Management Control Board, and they had issued what some call the little hood a report or, or uh, you know, a safety, the 2019 safety report into the T. And, you know, both reports really highlight uh, staffing as a, a very, uh, you know, an area where the, the T has been lacking, uh, both filling positions and in recruiting 
folks and the hiring process certainly has been broken for quite some time. Also, the shift from uh, operation to capital in terms of how they focus resources. But for me, the, the most glaring uh, issue raised has been the, the poor communication at the T. And I think that's the way the T communicates, you know, with its partners in government, uh, whether, you know, within MassDOT or within self esteem organization with the legislature, but also how it communicates with the public. And I think more importantly, uh, internally, uh, when you have folks on the ground level doing the work that are, you know, responsible for keeping the, the system up and running, uh, feeling like they can't raise uh, these issues uh, to higher ups, feeling like there could be retaliation or that they could just be ignored and having been ignored, kind of giving up on uh, sounding the alarm. Uh, and for me, that was a, a key concern. It's been a great deal of focus that we've had uh, during our transportation committee's oversight hearings. Uh, but obviously a, a huge issue, uh, not going to be solved all overnight, but uh, look forward to working with all of our partners uh, in government and outside to get this right. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Bob. And, and Senator, before we proceed, I do give you a, uh, want to give you a chance to respond. There was a Commonwealth Magazine uh, article about uh, one of the podcasts, the CODcast they did with you and your House counterpart, Representative William Strauss. And in it, it suggested that uh, you said there will be new money for the T, but it has to be accompanied by a change in leadership at the Transit Authority. Uh, the MBTA needs new leaders to move forward. You said that didn't accurately characterize what, what you're feeling. Yeah, I, I, I don't mean to, to say Commonwealth got it wrong. Um, uh, by any means, they're a great organization we work with uh, regularly, and, and Bruce does a great job. Um, I just, my message isn't a change in leadership uh, is is needed. Uh, you know, that's going to happen naturally as we transition to a new administration. Uh, I, I am committed to working with the current, uh, you know, leadership at the T, at MassDOT, and within this administration, because there are key issues we need to to focus on right now and tackle on and to, to maintain levels of service to create, you know, better safety outcomes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't want to say they got it wrong. I, I very well could have, uh, you know, misspoke or, or misled them to think that, but I, I have never called for a change of leadership within this T. There's a new administration coming in. I will leave that up to uh, our next governor, um, but we will continue to work with them. Okay. I just wanted to give you a chance to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, Monica, you were, of course, on the uh, Fiscal Management and Control Board for its entire existence, six years, and you were there in 2019 when the so-called uh, Ray LaHood report was issued on safety problems at the T. And uh, the FTA noted that not a lot was done to uh, respond to that report since 2019. Can you tell us what happened and, and why there wasn't the response? I mean, it's incredibly complicated, but I, I will try and summarize it. I think many of the things that the FMCB had identified and many of the things that a lot of experts we've worked with had identified, we put together a lot of steps, but they're very difficult. And I think the FTA report really reiterates that. And I think it really comes down to it's a cultural issue. I think that encompasses communication. I think that encompasses the employees' feeling about working at the agency. And I think it's that culture that we struggled the most to take on because it wasn't just with the existing leadership that has been going on for decades. And so I think being able to sh not shift that culture in the amount of time that the FMCB had, I think made addressing a lot of those items that we had identified in the 2019 safety report virtually impossible. I think it's going to take a restructuring of the organization. I think it's going to take significant hires and the right hires and then I do think it is going to be really looking at this organizational chart and really looking at the accountability. This is something I think the FMCB, we probably discuss every other week, talking about the accountability, talking about the structure. And I think personally, really looking at the frontline employees, using that knowledge, but creating an environment that is safe for them to actually engage with leadership. Because if you can't get the frontline employees, you can't get the middle management to feel that they can actually communicate the issues on the system, communicate to leadership what is actually going on, it is going to be impossible to address really many of the directives that the FTA has laid out. But I have to say, for me personally, in those six years, that was the most frustrating part of it. And probably what I consider my biggest failure was not being able to start that cultural shift. 
and be able to see that through with the amount of time that we had had. But I think with this existing leadership and then the new administration, if that is not the number one focus, the central focus, and the item that no one will allow to be continued to be delayed, I don't know what will happen to the T, but I think more importantly, I don't know what is going to happen to the confidence that the public has in the system. And I think it will make it to the point where riders don't just want to not use the system, but it makes it impossible for them to do so. And that is for the people who are privileged enough to have any other option. And I think that often gets lost in this. I think we talk about, well, you know, they're making these choices. People aren't going to ride the system. Well, there are many people who have absolutely no choice but to ride the system. And I think if we are not focused on them and if we are not focused on the employees, it really doesn't matter all these other decisions. The financials are very important, but we can't allow that to continue to be a distraction from these central issues that are causing all of this. And I also don't think that we're going to be able to communicate to the legislature, to the FTA, what the financial needs actually are if the internal system cannot be addressed. And Monica, uh, I'd like to turn to Colleague now because you mentioned, you know, the, the people who really have no choice but to take public transit. And Colleague, you represent a lot of those people. What's your interpretation of this FTA report and what the T has to do to regain their confidence? Right. So uh, I think just coming into this, I think we've, we've said it here a number of times, safety is key, right? The writers want a safe uh, MBTA. They want to be able to feel safe as they travel. The workers want a safe workplace and a safe environment to operate these uh, operate these machines and get people to where they you know where they need to go. So that's definitely a, a key piece that we should be taking into account. Um, as well as the fact of the matter is that we should be actually listening to our workers, the folks that are on the ground every day, seeing what's like, seeing uh, what needs to be fixed, what what needs to be done differently. Um, and our, work, our, our writers that are experiencing uh, the, the product that we have to give with the MBTA every day. Um, though I think these are two key pieces uh, that need to be like really be uh, brought up and focused on more, like what's the worker experience and the writer experience and how, what do they have to say about how the team moves into the future. Um, and then I think lastly, just uh, I think it's clear that we need to make investment um, into the MBTA. None of, I think what we're going to be talking about uh, can really happen without us really investing um, into uh, the future of the MBTA and into making sure that it's going to be equitable, affordable, um, accessible for uh, both workers and writers. Thank you, colleague. And, and Brian, uh, you have been involved with the MBTA for a long time. Uh, you remember when it was a revered and respected agency, as you uh, told us once, that uh, it has fallen from grace in a sense. What is it going to take to get the confidence of the public back? Uh, well, Bob, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And, and thanks to Josh. It, it's wonderful to um, be on a panel with Senator Crichton, Monica, and, and Kalik. Uh, yeah, I mean, the T used to be the gold standard of, of transit systems in this in this continent. I mean, it was the system that extended the red line on two ends while putting the orange line underground and uh, greatly expanding bus and commuter rail all within a decade uh, in the 1980s. Um, and that came from from real leadership and real focus. And, and I guess... Um, you know, to, to answer your question about the FTA roadmap, I mean, one thing that's, that's clear to me that the FTA said is that the T needs to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And by that, I mean, it can't just focus on one thing, such as spending capital dollars. But more than that, it, it, and, and this, this relates to what everyone else has said about culture and safety, it needs some sort of an independent third party poking it and prodding it and almost forcing it to do the right thing. I think if anything, what we've seen from this FTA report as well from the, as well from the Low Hood report is that the centralization of, of, of public transit in, in the hands of, of the single administration, which is the governor, just hasn't worked. Not only that, the external agency, the Department of Public Utilities, which is supposed to be an independent safety oversight committee, also reports to the same administration. 
And so by centralizing everything, I think what we've seen is uh, the, a, a lack of focus on something. And that's only human nature. You, you, people need someone sort of reminding them from time to time what's important and what should be going on. And that's why my organization has advocated for a long time. You know, there needs to be an independent third party, uh, such as ourselves or, or someone else, that can really force the T with teeth to, to do the right thing and not lose focus on what is most important to riders. And, and its employees. Senator Crichton, is restructuring the management of the T something the legislature would take on? I mean, I think it's certainly something we're having conversations around. I don't know that that's uh, necessarily the role we're going to lead on. Obviously, we, we do have a new administration coming in, so we do want to work with them and, and to, to hear their thoughts and kind of flush out some of these ideas. Uh, so right now, I think the objectives of our oversight hearings are both you know, the immediate safety concerns, but also getting more information to help inform us as we start to gear up for a new session and to see what role we can play there. I, I honestly, I don't have the answers I'm trying to talk to and listen to as, as many folks as I can. So there's no set path that I'm ready to, to pave yet, uh, but it's clear uh, something needs to change, something significant. Um, and, um, you know, we look forward to being a partner with that, not only with the administration, but also with folks like we have on the panel and, and many uh, other uh, stakeholders that uh, are experts in this field. And Monica, what about your perspective in terms of changing the management structure? It seems like the T between capital and operating has been stretched too thin. Uh, is it capable of handling both huge tasks? I think under the existing structure, no. I think a lot of people have talked about what they would like to see as far as, you know, as Brian identified this oversight and what people want to see as far as what the connection DOT has to the MBTA. I won't talk about my own specific opinions on this, but I will say what is happening is not working. There are not enough checks and balances. I think that the MBTA is stretched too thin. I think they would be stretched too thin even if they did have all these employee positions filled. I think the role of DOT needs to be better defined. And I do think that there needs to be something in between the T and the administration. Because I think the goals of DOT and the goals of the MBTA, while they often align, they don't always. And I think those of us who have worked under the previous system, where you had these separations, can point out a lot of things that were significantly easier. And I think especially around planning and the budget. And I agree with Brian, the role was much different when the MBTA advisory board had more oversight over the budget. And I think we need to really look at, this was an experiment that has been going on for quite some time. I think we've identified the things that clearly don't work. I think the disagreement is over what changes would be made, but changes do need to be made. And I think in the FTA report, it also identifies a lot of those central issues. And so my hope would be that the new administration really looks at this and really looks at how are these roles structured? How are the shared services structured? And are we gonna be able to meet any of these goals that the FTA has laid out if we continue to have this structure of accountability without checks and balances? And, and Kalik, uh, when you hear talk about, you know, uh, changing the management structure, you have brought up the fact that the current management doesn't seem to be listening to riders or workers. So how do you accomplish that listening uh, element? I mean, I think there's a number of ways to create that listening element, uh, potentially uh, creating a space that workers and riders, like, I don't know if it would be a board or, uh, or something of that nature, but a space for workers and riders to have the, their opinions uh, heard and actually listened to. Um, it, it would be different than uh, board, like going to board meetings, which, you know, our membership has often um, gone to and like made uh, numerous amounts of public comment, but someplace where there's uh, an advisory board of uh, workers and writers that like can be like, we hear what you want to do on the ground, it's not gonna work like that. This is what actually needs to happen instead, or this is what our suggestion is in order to move this thing along. Um, and being able to hear that and make sure that, making sure that it's on the record um, and that not only 
uh, are we saying that to uh, folks that are uh, that are, are making these decisions, but the making sure that other folks in the community can hear that these are the things that our folks are bringing up? You know, at the beginning of each of the MBTA uh, board meetings, there was public comment, and often it would it would last an hour or more. A lot of the same people all the time would be on, and you'd wonder, is in fact anyone listening to what the public is saying? Uh, Brian, you represent all these communities served by the MBTA. Are you listening? Are you hearing what users are, are having to say about the system? I mean, absolutely, Bob. Um, my, my members are mayors and select board chairs from cities and towns from across eastern and central Massachusetts. And, and uh, you know, I think Senator Crichton will, will agree that, you know, it's often their local representatives, their mayors, their reps, their senators that get stopped and asked about T issues, uh, even though there is not always direct uh, ability to make those changes. Uh, these are the folks that hear it. So, so my members often tell me that, you know, they're getting, they're hearing about complaints all uh, or, or issues all the time. Things like rusty stations on commuter rail, things like trash, dirty subway stations, uh, bad lighting, safety issues. Um, you know, if people don't feel safe on the system, they're not going to take it. So it's also a ridership and a retention issue. But yeah, I mean, I, we we hear all the time from folks, uh, you know, what what's wrong with the T. Uh, and what I try to do is is synthesize that and, and look at what the policy levers we have are to uh, to change, but also to um, to also tell the good news sometimes. I mean, the, we we often uh, dump on the T, but they do do some things very well, and and we we should remember that. I mean, they are the largest provider of electricity powered trips in, in New England every day. You know, far and away above any any Tesla trips. Um, this is a good thing and something that we need to expand upon. Uh, and so, you know, I, I try to uh, temper the the complaints with the compliments uh, where I can. Senator Crichton, how do you respond to people who say, uh, you know, when what will it get better? Will the MBTA get better? I mean, I think most folks would agree the uh, the FTA coming in for only the second time in the country's history to, you know, a state into an organization and investigating it was certainly a wake up call. Um, I think, you know, the administration and the, the T responded quickly, though I think they could have communicated uh, better um, throughout the process. You know, they've met the directives. They continue to, to work towards this. You know, that was cited in the FTA report that, you know, all levels of the T were working closely with them to try to resolve this. Um, so, you know, I, I think we can address these issues. I'm glad that the administration has finally said, yes, we, we could use more resources because myself, previous chairs, previous legislators, uh, my old boss, Tom McGee, everyone is asked, you know, time and time again, what more do you need to have a safe and reliable system and also to have the system we, our riders deserve, our, our public deserves, and we've been told we have enough money by this administration. So it's nice that now we're having an honest conversation. Um, I think we need to get around what that number is to make these hires, uh, but also to make these repairs as a result of you know, decades of deferred maintenance. So we're on the, I think we're, it's hard not to do transportation ponds. I think we're on the right track to resolving some of these, but um, it's going to take a lot, lot more and something we're not going to solve overnight. So we really need to roll up our sleeves and have difficult conversations uh, also around revenue, uh, which is uh, going to need to be a part of the conversation. I sat in this morning on the audit and finance committee meeting where they reviewed means tested fares and free fares and what it may cost the T uh, to do that. And we're talking, you know, anywhere from uh, 40 million to uh, over $130 million for means tested fares alone and even more for free fares. But there is a lot of uh, momentum toward making transit more affordable, which means possibly less fair revenue. So what about resolving that uh, apparent uh, conflict? Monica, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, it's tough. Equity is an incredibly important part of transit. And I think especially here, we're a very segregated, very inequitable region. And we all know that. And, you know, as Kalik has pointed out many times, the people who are being punished the most are the ones who have to use the system. And I think the thing I've always found frustrating is many people will talk about, well, well, it's not that expensive. It's not that much money, but it actually is. And I think especially when you talk about what the impact that money is on a family, 
on buying your kid food. These are real, real numbers. And that's before you even talk about the commuter rail. So I think, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if free fares are the answer. I think that a lot of communities, a lot of organizations and a lot of elected officials have made a very solid argument that it is. I think for me on the means tested fares, I don't think we actually know how much this is going to be because I don't really think we have an understanding of how many people would actually be utilizing it. What I would like to see is a pilot. I have been pushing for a pilot on means tested fares. It feels like since the beginning of time. And I think if we can't do a pilot, we're never going to be able to answer this question. And I think when you throw out numbers that are massive, it makes it very easy for an agency to just be like, oh, no, we can't do that because we can't afford it. Except we don't actually know what that number is on means tested fares. I think on free fares, it's a, it's a tad easier to put that number together. But if you look around the country and you look at how many agencies have had means tested fares for so incredibly long, and they started with the pilots, they put those numbers together, and they actually put together a budget that could account for that. I think that's what we need to do. And I think that really needs to be the next step, because quite honestly, what people very rarely talk about is the fares don't cover the service anyways. It never has. And it never will. We can't charge it. If you've on the commuter, you cannot charge people enough to actually pay for that. And so then I think it's also a discussion of what other sources of revenue can we tap into? Because we don't have that many. And if you look around the nation, if you look around the world, there are many other ways to gain revenue. And I think that we have a very, very limited system. I think there are much more sophisticated ways to focus on own source revenue. But I think we really need to talk about doing that pilot because otherwise we just get distracted in the rest of these conversations while people still suffer to actually pay that fare every day. And remind us, Monica, where, what happened to that pilot proposal this time? The pilot proposal has died many deaths. The most recent I do believe was vetoed by the administration but it has really died in many different ways. It's been very diverse in that, but it was, it was vetoed by the administration. And I think for me, my frustration has always been just do a pilot, that's it. It can be a limited pilot, just do the pilot. And I think the veto on that was heartbreaking, especially for us, how long people and the community have been asking for this. And even the employees have been asking for this. I hope the next, next administration just does the pilot because it will answer that question. And if we keep kicking that can, I think it really just reinforces that we don't care about those communities. We don't care about equity because there's no other translation that you can grab from that. It's interesting that the, the T staff has been working on what the financial implications of those systems might be anyway, regardless of that veto. Yeah. Colleague, yeah. this is really an important issue for your community, I know. What, what, you know, is it, should it all be free? Should it be means tested? Do, what, what is your take on this? You know, I tend to, to since I've been working on this issue, um, I've been talking about a low income fare or as, as the T's called it, a, a means tested fare. Uh, we think that is the way that is uh, really going to speak to um, the ridership and really going to speak to, uh, to, to people that need to use it. Uh, I've been doing organizing for a, a little while um, and some of the things that we've, we've worked on are things like the youth pass, um, which is essentially uh, a means tested for, for young people, right? Um, and we have the senior pass again, in the, same, in the same mold, it just makes sense to go ahead and move that for the rest of the general public, folks that we know, you know, uh, need a break. <laughs> and and uh, these, again, and Monica said it earlier, like these are the folks that can't, they don't have an option but to ride the T. Um, we saw it during the pandemic, like you, as ridership, like as ridership dropped, you know, very deeply, there are still folks that had to these the folks that were our essential workers that had to get out and get to work and the t is what took like what moved them to and fro so we know we already know some things like a low income fare um are going to 
really move people. Um, and people are going to, like, I, I feel like people are going to use it. We, we've looked at things like the MIT study uh, that when, when folks got a, a, fr a free or reduced pass, uh, they used it to go to uh, more than just work. They used it to go to to doctor's appointments. They used it to go to uh, bettering uh, for education, things of that nature. So, uh, yes, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> a little, yeah, well, there definitely is where we do. We're talking reduced fares like 50%, like the senior discount, 50%. That makes a huge difference in terms Absolutely. of what people can do. Does Mayor Wu's free bus proposal conflict with that in some way? I think these are two things that go hand in hand. Um, I think the thing with low income fare is that we talk about it being on all modes. Um, I commend Mayor Wu for moving free bus. Um, and like, I, I, I think those things, these two things uh, deeply are connected, um, especially somebody that lives uh, that family, like, I grew up in Hyde Park, Mattapan area, right? So like, like <laughs> grow, growing up having a free 28 uh, or after I graduated having a free 28 would have been like, you know, game changing for like somebody in, in, my, in my neighborhood. So I understand the implications of what it means to have uh, access to uh, free buses and, and it being able to move people. And um, that being said, it would call it, it still needs to be connected to something like a low income fare uh, to be able to have access to all other modes. So folks ride the rail, folks ride the commuter rail. Um, I have family and friends that have moved out to, to Brockton and things like that. As the city becomes more prohibitive to live because of cost, folks are moving further out. Folks are moving to Lowell, folks are moving to Brockton, folks are moving to, like, to places that uh, are gonna need access to commuter rail access. Um, and right now it, it costs so much. Uh, I know we've talked to folks that are in Lowell and it's like, I feel like it's, um, if I remember correctly, it's almost like t maybe close to $20 round trip a day if you have to go and come back. So yeah, those are, yeah. yeah. That 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 fair, you know, the people who are being forced out of the city economically end up having to pay the most to get back in. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I see you nodding. What what about that? Is there is really is it possible to change that kind of a policy? Well, anything's possible, Bob. I, I guess it, the only way we're going to change it, though, is, is if we get to the heart of the issue, which is what do we want the T to be or, or what do we need the T to be? Um, lots of folks talk about the T as a, as a public good, like a utility, like a gas company, like an electric company. And lots of other folks tell the T, no, you got to increase your own source revenue and you got to make more money and you got to have less burden on the taxpayer. You can't do both. Um, and, and I think there is a schizophrenia inside the, the authority, inside the T. I mean, I know when I worked there, uh, you know, we right around after 2015, we had all these mandates, you know, you will increase your own source revenue by X percent every year. And we went out and did that. And, you know, that cuts against doing things like low income fares. Um, that's the exact opposite. So we need to kind of figure out what what is this thing? Is it a public service? Is it a, in, a, a traffic reduction entity? Is it a poverty reduction entity? Is it something else? Is it meant to just get folks from Plymouth and Lowell and Brockton in and out of Boston every day? You know, the model that we've built, that we've been using to organize, fund, and operate the T has fundamentally changed. Uh, the, the society that we live in is not what it was when, when this was created, or even when the T took over commuter rail in the 70s. It, it's, a, it's a very different place. And so to answer your question, Bob, yes, we, we can change this. We are the, we are an incredibly wealthy part of this country. We have some of the smartest people in the world living here. It's a great place to live. And, and we in Massachusetts can really do anything. I believe that. It's just a question of figuring out what we want to do. And that's a broader discussion that I don't think we've had, but I really hope we can have. And I certainly hope that the next administration has. It sounds like all of the above, Brian, when I hear you list those things. But Senator it can't be all of the above. It, it's <laughs> proven well, it, it doesn't know how to do that. So what is it? Yeah, but in a sense, it is. And that's that's the huge challenge. But Senator Crichton, from where you sit there on Be Beacon Hill, uh, controlling the purse strings and the, and the revenue and looking at, at what's ahead for the T, 
What's your reaction to the free, fair, means-tested fair uh, debate that's going on? I mean, I'm, I'm a strong supporter uh, of means-tested fairs, long-income fairs. Uh, I agree with Kalik earlier. I, I you know, I, I respect uh, Mayor Wu a great deal, and she's been a, a tremendous leader on transportation. I don't think us focusing on means-tested is a knock on, uh, you know, free free buses by any means. I think, you know, we can pursue both. I, I do think all modes uh, need to be addressed with this. Um, you know, the Senate has been on record, the House has been on record. You know, it, it was vetoed, as we had said before, but it's something I hope in the next session that whether we do it uh, legislatively or the administration just goes ahead and does it, a pilot absolutely makes sense, Monica. And thank you for continuing to to be on top of this issue and really push it. Um, it, it it's not working for riders. I mean, I, I live in Lynn. Uh, it's, you know, uh, less than 30 minute commuter rail ride, but you won't see many of my constituents in Lynn getting on the commuter rail for $7 for a one way trip, not to mention parking or transfers. Uh, and that's the case across the system. Uh, and even as you go to lower fare modes, it's still hurting these families that can't can't get there. And I, I think I do look at it as a, uh, you know, for the greater good, whether or not you use the tea, you benefit from a robust tea that is getting people off the roads. It's, you know, getting people to where they need to go for the economy. I mean, it serves a greater good. And, um, you know, I, I'm committed to, you know, pushing this from our from our end uh, on the transportation committee. But I know many of my colleagues feel the same way. This We're, we're operating, uh, you know, under a system that is no longer relevant. Uh, when you think of, you know, commuting patterns generally and this, you know, idea around the nine to five, you know, commuter rail from the suburbs, like we're going to, you know, just have it's really it's catered to a, a, an economy of the past and um, it really needs to shift. So I'm going to strongly support, uh, you know, whether it's regional rail or electrification, which, you know, gets us there to a better price point, reduces carbon emissions, increases frequency, uh, but also for other modes to make sure that every resident can get where they need to go. It benefits everybody. Um, Hard to get there, though, which, again, means a hard conversation around revenue. And Senator, wasn't there a time when you could take the commuter rail for 240 from Lynn for a while? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we've had occasional pilots here and there. Well, what happened to that pilot? Did, yeah, did it work? should have just changed, changed it for good. Um, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, a pilot, I think, is a right direction generally. But when you're doing it last minute because of a pandemic or, you know, some money just appeared and you don't advertise it, like, Changing commuter patterns, I think, is a, is a difficult thing for folks. Um, so it doesn't happen overnight. You know, any pilot that's done, I want to make sure it's it's done in a way that all all residents are informed of its benefits. That we're doing a great job to to get the message out there and make sure that it's you know an accessible and and worthwhile pilot with a robust schedule. There's a lot of variables that need to be taken in consideration. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes we saw that with the ferry inland. We've seen it with the commuter rail. It's not always necessarily. Um, the best approach that's been taken. Well, certainly that 240 fare would increase ridership uh, if given enough time and people realized uh, the convenience. Uh, I'd like to bring up probably what was the, the highest priority item on the FTA report, so important that in June, they issued four directives and the very first one was deferred maintenance, which we're all familiar with. Um, so the reaction was to shut down the orange line for for 30 days with the promise that service would be uh you know faster and more convenient and better when it was all over frankly it hasn't turned out that way people are wondering you know why is it still so slow and it seems like there is a misstep on the t by and I think Steve Poftak, the general manager, even admitted maybe maybe I was leading people to believe that service would be faster when this was done. The fact that it isn't, I mean, that really gets to the core of do people trust the T? Can they trust what the T has to say? So let me start. Monica, what about that issue of trust? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what the senator said. It's a communication. If they knew that it wasn't going to speed it up, then be very clear. I feel like quite honestly, the public does not get enough credit for their patients. If you're honest to them, they hate being lied to, just be honest. If you need to shut it down for 90 days for the service to be better, fine. But tell them exactly what's going to happen. Don't guess, don't hope, just be clear and be sure. 
And I think a lot of these shutdowns are going to have to happen. And I think it's the thing people don't want to talk about. They're going to have to happen. You can either schedule them, work with the public, work with the communities to schedule them reasonably, or they can happen unexpectedly and destroy everyone's commute. But I think on the orange line, if you knew it wasn't going to be able to do that, or even it wasn't going to be able to do that, just be honest. And I think that is the thing that the agency struggles with. I don't think in a lot of ways they're intentionally trying to deceive the public. I think sometimes they're very optimistic about the matter. But in transportation, we can't just be optimistic. We can't make an educated guess. You have to be sure. It is much better to over-deliver than to continuously under-deliver. I hope the agency learned a lesson from this one, especially (laughs) since many more are going to have to come. But if they cannot start just being very clear, this is what's going to happen, even if nothing's going to come of it other than the fact that it will be safer. Like you may not be like, oh, it's a smoother ride or I got there faster, but it's like, no, you are now safer on this system. The public can accept that. When the public feels like you are constantly lying to them, constantly asking more than is reasonable, it's never going to get better. That relationship will never get better. And I think giving more respect to the community, but also giving them a bit more credit for what they have been willing to put up with. That's a really good point, Monica, because I think a lot of us who covered the shutdown were really kind of surprised at how willing the public was to go along with it. Yeah. And, you know, realizing that if the end result was going to be better service, we understand that mm-hmm. you have to shut it down to fix it. And I think mm-hmm. they kind of blew that, you know, advantage and credibility they had briefly there. Yeah. What, what about, you know, the people in the community feel that they're being lied to by the T? Folks are disappointed, <laughs> to say the least. Um, we recently held a forum. Um, around transportation um, and folks being able to share stories about, uh, you know, uh, what's what's been happening with the T shutdown and, and all these other other pieces that, that have been going on. Um, and I think a, a point <laughs> that's, that's there is that we had a group of folks coming from Chelsea and they were using the MBTA to, cut, to get there. And due to scheduling and uh, I think a bus not showing up, they were about 20 to 30 minutes late to the actual event that's talking about what issue folks are having with the T, right? It's indicative of the relationship that uh, we, we folks at the end that get serviced by the MBTA are having. Um, I, I, I totally agree, Monica, you are right in terms of folks are patient. And if we were, if we were told that, okay, this is going to make the T safer, we have like folks have eyes. We've seen what's been happening with the MBTA. We want a safe MBTA. And we're like, well, you know, if it's got to shut down to be safe, that's fine. Let's have a discussion about it. Don't rush this piece and just go ahead and tell us you're doing it and then just go ahead and do it without having folks properly able to figure out how they're going to be able to get to work how they're going to get their their students to school? How students when they're when, when school is starting, they're how they're supposed to get to school? I would have been totally devastated as a kid uh, growing up in Boston that went to John D. O'Brien, coming from Hyde Park, trying to figure out how it was like, ugh, okay, <laughs> this is this is going to be a little bit di- little bit difficult. Um, so I think the 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 piece there that there needs to be more communication, right? Mm-hmm. There they need to be able to trust. Um, the T needs to trust uh, the ridership as much as we give them the patience to make things better. That's a really good point, colleague. And uh, Brian, what about that? Can people trust what the T tells them? Were they ever able to? And I, I, I agree with everything Monica and colleague just just said. Um, and I, I think the trust factor goes a lot deeper, Bob. I mean, every time um, we hear this train is being taken out of service, that erodes trust. Every time the T says there'll be a train every six minutes and it doesn't come for 20, that erodes trust. Every time the bus doesn't show up, like Kalik just said, for those folks in Chelsea, even though they can look at a schedule and it says it'll be here and it's not there, that erodes trust. And this all gets to the heart of the issue, which is, you know, a schedule is a promise and the T doesn't meet its promises. It doesn't meet its promises on a daily basis 
with the service it runs. It doesn't meet its promises on the big projects that it says it's going to do. And it certainly isn't meeting its promises um, for, for what it can be for this region and its economy and its ecology and its way of life. But the T's like the Red Sox. We just love them. We just love it. We're, it. It's in our DNA, those of us from here. You know, we we just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. Um, but, you know, there might come a point where we stop forgiving and, and we, we, we stop believing. And, you know, we might be starting to see that now with the, the number of folks who are choosing to drive. Um, you know, traffic congestion is, is, seems to be way up anecdotally. Um, maybe these folks have just had enough of being lied to and um, are deciding they're voting with their, their feet or their tires in this case, and they're driving. And that's not good for, for anyone. Uh, and especially, it's not good for, for the tea. Yeah, especially when you have 15 to 20 minute headways during rush hour, uh, which you, yeah. you know, on Twitter, you can see it every day, how people are absolutely frustrated by the lack of service. And they can't even get headway adherence on a reduced schedule. The schedule is significantly reduced from what it was pre-COVID, and they still can't meet that schedule. So, so panelist, why should we have hope? What, what gives us hope, Senator? Uh, thanks, Bob. I wish you asked someone else to lead off on this one. Um, it seems like a layup question, but I, I might have a hard time with it. No, it's, I mean, people are having these conversations now. I think, you know, you see a ridership that's a little bit, uh, you know, while disappointed, a, a little more engaged, at least in, in my experience. And Monica, I, I mean, the rest of the panel has articulated this well, too, but uh, we don't give them the riders enough credit. Um, and we should be communicating with them and in, in working with them. And I think we're seeing kind of a, a bigger focus on the T. Did it take a tragic loss of life and a number of disasters to get here? Yes, and that's very unfortunate. But I think with leadership, with someone that can you know come in or you know, with an organization and, and folks that can come in and again, be honest with their fellow stakeholders and government and with the public and say, here's what we need to get done. And, and I think we can, I think we can fix this. I think it's going to take, take some time and it's going to take some pain and it's going to take some hard conversations. But, uh, you know, I like Brian's Red Sox analogy, though uh, I'm very sour right now, as I am with the Red Sox, uh, you know, come spring training, I'm right back there and we're ready to root for them and support them. And um, I think whether you're in the business community, whether you're someone trying to get your kids to school or to get to a medical appointment, um, I think, you know, having the tea is crucial for our economy. We have to get it right. Uh, it's funny. I was out in Western Massachusetts, uh, you know, doing some transportation tours out there in the Berkshires and the amount I've complained about my district's access to transit and public transportation, uh, where we have a bus line, a commuter rail line, you know, a subway, not that far away in Revere. Um, and then I go out there and it's, you know, a, a desert for the most part, uh, in terms of public transit, uh, I realize how crucial you know, the T is and how we are lucky to have them here, uh, though, obviously, we want them functioning at a much higher level. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a public good that we need to invest in and we need to, to fix uh, for, you know, for the entire community, not just the T rider. One of the things people said they learned during the Orange Line shutdown was how vital that line is, uh, how much they had to do with cope, coping with the absence of it. And I think another thing people have to realize is, and, and we've all suggested this, this is the beginning of a very long journey. And it's not going to happen quickly. And I worry that the public won't have the patience to, to see it through. Um, what about that? Are we, you know, Brian, you talk about a golden age of the tea, and we wish we could return to that. But what, you know, is, is it possible to, to get back to a situation where people really respect the tea and, and, and use it, or are we kind of stuck here for quite a while? We're, it's not going to get better anytime quickly. Um, I, I foresee major significant shutdowns uh, annually for a long time, um, just because they need access to, to the system. 
Um, but yes, I, I, I do have hope, Bob. Um, you know, just like we saw with the Red Sox, to beat an analogy to death, you know, with the right ownership and the right management and the right players, uh, miracles can happen. Um, so, you know, it won't be a miracle that the the T uh, becomes the system it once was in terms of reliability. And it won't be a miracle that it becomes the envy of, of, of the continent again. It's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of money. Um, you know, organizations like mine have been warning that bad things like this are going to happen for a very long time. And it's happening. Um, and we didn't get here overnight and you, you can't fix 30 years of deferred maintenance in, in 30 days. So it's going to take some pain. It's going to take some money. It's going to take a lot of time, but yes, I, I do believe, you know, there will come a day when the, the T is like a, a referee is supposed to be in a, in a ball game, you know, they're there, but you ignore them. Um, it just works. And that's the goal, a system that just works without having to think about it. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Kalik, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is, you know, a new administration. Um, you know, we have a new leadership that's going to be coming in. Um, and we, we hope that they will be able to uh, really uh, take some leadership <laughs> um, in, in, in terms of helping to turn this tea around. Um, there's... Uh, Things like a uh, fair share amendment uh, that are coming down the pike with the vote in, in November. Um, we recently actually, uh, we have a report coming out soon um, about how yes on question one um, will affect uh, the MBTA and, and safety. Um, so, you know, we, that, yeah, we have that coming out uh, fairly soon. Um, and as well as, I think what gives me hope is the idea that if we open up and really work with our labor and really work with uh, our writers, we can actually take this thing and, and, and turn it around. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that I feel like our writership will be, they'll be forgiving to a, a point if we prove to them that we understand that things like uh, shutdowns and uh, you know, uh, service uh, changes are going to happen, but we acknowledge that it's going to actually affect them and we compensate them in, in the way that they need to be. <laughs> um, and making sure that, you know, we understand that we're taking a chunk out of your life by doing this. This is what we can do in this, in this interim period. Um, I feel like with a new administration and with new, like, uh, with new leadership coming in, we have the potential to st really step into that. So that's what's giving me hope. And yeah, I would say that. And Monica, you must have hope because you were on the Fiscal Management Control Board for six years. Uh, what continues to give you hope? I mean, honestly, one of the first thing is the riders. And I know they're mad. Even when I get my teeth cleaned, I hear about how angry my dentist is about the red line. You can't go anywhere without hearing this. But the thing I don't hear is, oh, it should close. Oh, it should go away. Oh, we should do something different. We should get private vendors. No one is saying that. No one has said that. People just want it better because it is ingrained in the fabric of the Commonwealth. The T is Massachusetts. It is, it's a huge part of this. And that anger means that people still care. And the other thing is every time I get on a train, every time I get on a bus and I see that operator, everyone talks about, oh, these 2000 open positions, we need, to, we need to get new people, we need to get new people. But no one talks about the thousands of people that show up every single day at awful hours under awful conditions, independent of what the weather's like or what's going on in their life. They show up every day. And they show up because they care. That is the heartbeat of the agency. All of the arguments around the things going on in leadership, administration is going on in the legislature that doesn't talk about the people who are actually the backbone of that system. This will get better. It will be painful, but it will get better because it has no choice but to get better because it's our system. And we won't accept it not getting better. And so I think what people need to do is hang in there and we need a new administration. We need some leadership restructuring. We need organizational restructuring. 
But with the FTA report, it's pointing out a lot of this. No one can ignore this anymore. We're here. The reckoning is happening. And I think with the new administration and a new outlook and a new relationship with the communities, with the riders, this can be done because it has no choice but to be. There are people like me who are crazy enough that probably 60 years from now, I will still be complaining about the things that I want to happen, but I will still be complaining in my hundreds as I wait for my bus and get on my train each day. So yes, it will get better. I have nothing but the utmost faith that it will. Uh, we we'll, we'll just have a few minutes left. And uh, just a general question, as you read the FTA report and what it's recommending, do you think it has its priorities right in terms of what has to be done first, what's the most important thing? What are your thoughts about that? Who would like to go first? Well, Brian? I'll just I'll just quickly say yes because it's it's focus is safety and, and safety has to be the the, the top priority. Um, it, it just has to be um, and and calling it to and, and calling bringing into light the fact that folks in the operations control center are working sixteen hour days and the lack of certifications and and all of that basic housekeeping stuff is the job of, of agencies like the DPU, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they're just not doing it. So yes, the FTA's priorities are correct in the fact that they are putting safety front and center where it has to be. I understand we have a question from the audience. Josh, are you there? Thank you, Bob. Yes, we've had a, a question came in that um, talks about a uh, cause for hope. What kinds of transformative projects are we likely to see that would uh, help to inspire riders? Uh, these things obviously are a year or more off, but uh, people have asked about you know, red-blue connector or uh, electrification, uh, other projects that might um, inspire uh, folks. And obviously that's not gonna give hope for someone's commute tomorrow, but we, uh, as, as Monica said, we're here for the long haul. Inspiration for the future. Who would like to talk about that? Well, as an elected official, I need to, to jump <laughs> in to speak on my pet project. Now it's, um, I, I think the, the electrification piece uh, needs to be a part of this. Uh, you know, transportation sector is obviously the highest uh, emissions producing sector of our economy. Uh, we had a, a tremendous discussion and uh, a vote from the Fiscal Management Control Board to approve phase one uh, a few years back. And Monica was there throughout those deliberations. Uh, so that would be uh, the environmental justice corridor as well as the Fairmont line. Uh, these are communities that for far too long have had you know, diesel locomotives riding through their communities, spewing out particulate matter, diesel's emissions, uh, charging way too much for a, a train ride to get into town a short distance away. Uh, it's the right thing to do to, you know, increase reliability uh, on the system. These trains are far more reliable to reduce emissions and to bring that price point down and that frequency up. So I know there are a lot of capital projects out there. This one's a no brainer. We should not be continue to throw bad money or sorry, good money <laughs> at bad and outdated technologies that continue to bring carbon emissions in our air and into our neighborhoods. And that goes for buses too, I take it. Uh, Kalik, you'd like to add to the conversation about what gives uh, inspirational projects for the future that might give people hope? Um, I don't know if necessarily any projects. I think um, we were on the right track when we, with this current board, uh, with making sure that there was a labor seat um, and making sure that there was a uh, an environmental justice seat on it. Uh, I would like to see more, <laughs> uh, make sure that we have uh, representation from maybe potentially workers, um, more, uh, what do you call it, representation from the writing public um, that are able to sit on like a board like this. Uh, and again, maybe potentially a, a, a whole separate a body of a, a, an advisory board with workers and writers, folks that again, are on the ground, know the day to day, and can speak to it and, and talk about these changes uh, that need to happen. And anyone else as we wrap up here who would like to add to that? I want to thank you all for really a great discussion. We covered a lot of territory. Um, this is an important time for transportation in Massachusetts. I can't remember a time when things are converging to such a critical point. So the decisions we make and the political momentum that we may have to make those changes, I think is really significant. So 
I hope we will be able to have this conversation going forward to something obviously is not going to be resolved anytime soon. So thank you all for your, your insight and your comments today. Senator uh, Brendan Crichton from Lynn, Monica Tibbetts Nutt, always great to see you from the 128 Council, Brian Kane, dedicated to the T, to the core, <laughs> and Kalik. Thank you so much for the work that you do representing people who really do depend on the MBTA to get around. Now, we'd like to uh, let you know that the video recording of this is going to be available. I think somebody's trying to communicate with me on, it will be on the GBH Forum Network's website. Um, and Brian, we want you to plug your event coming up on Tuesday. Let people know about that. No, oh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, next Tuesday, the 18th, uh, from 10 to 1, we have a forum uh, featuring Senator Crichton, as well as Kim Driscoll, candidate for lieutenant governor, talking about what the potential next administration's priorities will be, as well as a series of former executives at the T and, and thought leaders. Uh, so mbtaadvisoryboard.org for details. Thanks, Bob. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. It's been a wonderful discussion. And uh, thanks to everyone at the GBH Forum Network for making this possible. And we all hope to see all of you again soon. Thanks so much.